ओम ज्ञान चिरंजन छंदा सीम्स टू बी इेगुलर दीटर वन एक्सप्रेस मूवमेंट movement that means movement right not 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 like the hari krishna movement <laughs> there's a, it's another it's one word with two two different meanings vyaha vyaha passing ages passing ages yeah that word is usually used for for age as in the age of a person what is your vyasam what is your age 20 years 30 years 40 but for krishna of course there's no age there's no time but it's just for the universal form his age is the passing ages translation o king the rivers are the veins of the gigantic body the trees are the hairs of his body and the omnipotent air is his breath the passing ages are his movements and his activities are the reactions of the three modes of material nature <clears throat> purport the personality of godhead is not a dead stone nor is he inactive as is poorly thought by some schools he moves with the progress of time and therefore he knows all about the past and future along with his present activities there is nothing unknown to him the conditioned souls are driven by the reactions of the modes of material nature which are the activities of the lord as stated in the bhagavad gita chapter 7 text 12 the modes of nature are under his direction only and as such no natural functions are blind or automatic the power behind the activities is the supervision of the lord and thus the lord is never inactive as is wrongly conceived the vedas say that the supreme lord has nothing to do personally as is always the case with superiors but everything is done by his direction as it is said not a blade of grass moves without his sanction in the brahma sanhita it is said that all the universes and the heads of them the brahmas exist only for the duration of his breathing period the same is confirmed here the air on which the universes and the planets within the universes exist is nothing but a bit of the breath of the unchallengeable unchallengeable virata purusha so even by studying the rivers trees air and passing ages one can conceive of the personality of godhead without being misled by the formless conception of the lord in the bhagavad gita it is, it is stated that those who are much inclined to the formless conception of the supreme truth are more troubled than those who can intelligently conceive of the personal form the next verse the first analogy given is about kishan hairs on the head ah uh, so that is compared to ambu vahan which means the clouds that carry water there some clouds i guess they're not carrying water they're just the purely white clouds they're just composed of moisture but they're, they're not heavy with water so uh i just wanted to relate that this morning as you 
must have all noticed, there was a lot of thunder and lightning, and it appeared that there was going to be a big storm. But I remembered the Chanakya Shlok that Srila Prabhupada often used to quote as Aja Yudhe Rishi Shraddha uh, Prabhate Mega Gorjane Dampatye Kolaha Chaiva Lagu uh, Bhavrambe Lagu Kriya that certain items, they start off looking like they're going to be something very big, but they turn out to be something very small. So examples are given of the uh, fight between goats, in which they make a big show like they're going to fight each other, but then they hardly fight each other. Then a shrad ceremony of rishis, because generally Brahmins, if they're invited to a shrad ceremony, they think now we're going to get fed very nicely. But the rishis, they only eat leaves from the forest, so it's not much fun to go to a rishi. And you're not going to get much dakshina from them also. What are they going to give you for dakshina? Then, uh, the roaring of the clouds in the morning and a fight between husband and wife. It starts off very big, but in the end, they just... Go on with life. I'm gonna go right with you. Okay, no, it's all right. Time to serve breakfast. Okay, sit down. I'll give you. Life goes on. There's another in the Bhagavatam also states uh, about Kali Yoga. This vidyut prayeshu megheshu that the clouds they'll mostly give lightning but not much rain. <laughs> so that we saw this morning. There was little, little rain for a short time. But you might have thought with so much thunder and lightning there's going to be a huge storm. But no. So, see I'm expert in technology. <laughs> Having a so much experience of every microphone. It's, it's a rule, I believe, in Iskon India especially, that the mic shouldn't work properly. <laughs> so, always something wrong with it. So, a description of the universal form and in the purport, Srila Prabhupada states, the personality of Godhead is not a dead stone, as, nor is he inactive, as is poorly thought by some schools. But this is, a, I mean, I just read this. I, I didn't know which show we were going to read this morning. But uh, it, it just struck me. I mean, this, one thing is that Srila Prabhupada He's writing this. He's not a dead stone either. He's writing this. You can practically feel how upset Prabhupada is with those who want to relegate God to being something impersonal or without activities. You can feel Prabhupada's upset. You can feel it in his writing. So this, uh, this also we see that Srila Prabhupada instituted deity worship all over the world. He was very concerned that the standards be properly maintained. I was just reading a letter yesterday. Of course, I read it several times before. Again, in the letter, you could feel how upset Prabhupada was that the t one temple had been set up and then it was closed down without even informing Prabhupada. And Prabhupada's writing, do you, do, don't you think you could just consult me before you close down the temple? It's a great insult to Krishna that you open the temple, you, you invite him to come, and then you tell him, okay, now you go away. So he, it was quite a long letter, and Prabhupada was very, very upset. And he wrote that, don't you realize, of course I'm paraphrasing here, 
Don't you realize who you're dealing with? This is the, this is the personality of Godhead. So this deity worship should be very properly performed. I see in Iskon throughout the world today. Here we go again with my latest complaints, or not the latest, but that uh, there's this idea that we should have deities because that inspires the devotees or the, the public or whatever. We have the deities for preaching, but we don't look after them to the standard that Prabhupada gave. We're not quite up to the standard, but Prabhupada's system was you come up to the standard and then you install deities. Not that you, not that you somehow or other have deities and you don't have puja. I, mean, I never heard of that. I mean, nowhere in India do people have deities and not do puja. And ISKCON is supposed to be setting the standard of deity worship. But we just have, we just make a show that they're here so everyone can come, but we don't worship them. It's a very, very odd situation. I think anyone would be surprised. Anyone in India would be surprised if they know that we have deities, but we don't worship them. I mean, we do aritis, but the, the, the puja, the daily puja, which is supposed to do the deities. I'm talking about a, a Prabhupada also. I mean, we have the Prabhupada deity. It's, it's a small thing just to, in this season, actually 12 months of the year in Chennai, just to have a little chandam for him. Otherwise, if you think the deity is just a stone, Arche Vishnu, Shila Dhir, Savai Naraki Saha. If you think the deity is just a stone, like Prabhupada is writing here, the personality of God, it is not a dead stone. So if you think, well, we just, we'll do, we have keep deity and just do the minimum, that's all. But that's not the idea. The idea, we have deities, or actually, in many cases, the, the deity worship is going on at a far less minimum standard than Prabhupada instituted. And once you once you go be below the bar, once you allow yourself to go be below the bar, there's no saying how far below you can go. It just gets worse and worse and worse. They always say, well, in future we'll get better. But I see in many cases it's going on for years and years. In some cases they just install the deities without... Uh, Without, even from the very beginning, they institute a standard which is substandard. So I've seen in places deities being worshipped by, it's very common now, deities are worshipped by non Brahmins, in some places by, even by non initiated devotees. Uh, the GBC did make a resolution this year which, uh, that no deity should be installed without. I think it was already there, but they, they, some resolution like that. But first, they have to consult the deity worship ministry and all this, because yeah, it's it's going on in, in so many places. Deities are just installed without being up to any proper standard, which is you know it's painful to Prabhupada and it's painful to anyone who has any feeling for Krishna. If you act we're supposed to believe that the deity is Krishna, then uh, it doesn't give pleasure, it gives pain that you call the deity and it just likes to neglect the deity and just, what, for, to have a deity so you can collect money or something. Call people and have some yagyas performed to remove their astrological doshas or whatever, sarpa dosha or whatever. <laughs> so there should be a, a proper standard of worship otherwise uh, in the name, name of deity worship we're just committing offenses like we say we should instead of thinking of the minimum we should always think of, think of the, how to do more and more and more and make things more opulent of course that we also have to be careful also we have to see some standard that, is, that can be maintained. Otherwise, someone gets very enthusiastic and they in, introduce so many new forms of service and then after some time they get fed up and they go off somewhere. Of course, we, we don't have that problem so much as just being 
substandard, let's say. So cleanliness, punctuality, offerings. There should be minimum number of aritis, minimum number of offerings to the deities. The offerings should be opulent. We're supposed to worship the deities in opulence. So on. This. Anyway, at least, could we have some chandan for Prabhupada? Could that be a rain? I mean, we have chandan there, I hope. It's supposed to be chandan yatra going on now. That's also not being done, it seems. So, uh, can we make some chandan for Prabhupada? Can we do that right now? At least you can, it's the very least you can do in calling the deity of Prabhupada. That can be done daily. There are so many ladies coming here. And, uh, they'll be happy to do that, isn't it? Isn't it? We, we serve the deities. One reason we like to do it is because we also become happy. If it becomes a duty that we don't like to do, and then uh, then we don't do it. If we just think it's a duty. But actually, if we have any Krishna consciousness, we should take pleasure in serving Krishna. I I had that experience very strongly the first time I went to Nathdwara in Rajasthan, one of the most famous deities in India, how the whole atmosphere is one of service to the deity. And they, they in, the local temple management, they involve people who are coming from outside in, in the deity service. How many chandan? There are so many rooms with so many things to do. Making garlands and cutting sabjis and all kinds of things. But I believe in those rooms there are people who are initiated in their sampradaya. That means Brahma Samban. They do that. But there are other things which you can do. Just, just like carrying wood for burning in the kitchen. Then anyone, they'll, they'll call. Seva Koro, come on, do some service. And They'll happily do that. And you'll see the nice Brahmin boys, the very nicely dressed in the very uh, aristocratic looking in the bagal bandis, the tie up shirt, and they'll be carrying the wood. Everyone's welcome to do service. So, one purpose of or one, of course, we don't think of purpose or, or in, in the terms of like a business person might think of a purpose. What will we get from doing this? But we, one reason for installing the deities is that people can come and engage in various services to the deities. But if we, if we have this idea that is, you know, just like some Hindu temple, keep the deity in a corner and when you feel like it, you do something and just somehow or other you keep the thing running on, then it becomes all offensive. So, how does this idea come? It's impersonalism, which is all pervading in the world and particularly grace of Sripad Shankaracharya in India. And this idea, everything is all one and... God is a person, yes, everyone will they'll accept that God is a person, but beyond God is the impersonal, which is nonsense, because God means the ultimate, the supreme. So this idea that the, the, the ultimate is impersonal, which means that God, even people believe in the impersonalists will say they believe in God and they'll worship their ishta devata, their their preferred form of God with the misunderstanding that God is not actually a person, but there are various persons like Ganesh and Shiva and Durga and Krishna who you can worship and who symbolize God. And nowadays they have Sai Baba and all others also. So... The, the idea that, that ultimately God is not a person, which is uh, it's very offensive to the personality of Godhead. 
if if you treat a person as if they don't exist, you just ignore them. Or, or you, you can say to someone, well, you're a nobody. In English, you'll say, you're a nobody. You're a non-entity. It means you have so little regard for them that you think they're not really a person at all. It's extremely insulting. I mean, if, you, if you're angry at someone, that's offensive. Well, not in all cases. If a mother is angry at her child, that's not offensive. But the anger of a demon like Hiranyakashipu, I mean, you can relate to it. Bhagavan relates to it by ripping the rascal's intestines out. So, I mean, you can reciprocate with it. But if someone just says that you are nothing and that you don't even you don't even recognize that they exist, then it's The most, uh, what can you say, is soul killing. It's, it's the, the nastiest and cruelest thing you can do. Just like in a prison, if you put someone in, being in prison is bad enough, but if they put you in solitary confinement, that's considered a, a very bad punishment. What's the punishment? Just because everyone knows that if you don't have any association, if you're just on your own, with no one to talk to, no one to reciprocate with. It's a very, uh, it, it just goes against the whole human psyche, and, or, or that of the soul. Because as living beings, we like to relate to others. We, in, in modern terms, we'd say we have a psychological need to do so. So to relegate God to the status of a non-person is ex- it's cruel. And there is, Krishna says, Ye prapadyante tans aham. So persons who think that God is not a person, that means, just like Prabhupada says, not a dead stone. They think he's like a stone, is lifeless. So such persons, they may enter into a stone as, as a punishment. That's one of the things that can happen if, you be, if you're an impersonist. You can enter a stone and, and be stuck in a stone without the uh, likelihood of Ramachandra coming and putting his lotus foot on you. And Like Ahalya, she had to enter a stone being cursed by Gautam for her, her husband, for her infidelity. But she got the pardon that eventually Lord Ram would come and deliver her. So, I would say it's a pretty good curse. I mean, I mean, it's better to be a stone and get the foot of Ramachandra on you and get the darshan of Ramachandra than just be a, anyone in this material world doing their ahara, nidra, bhaya, maitun, eating, sleeping, mating, and defending and just going on, punarapi dhananam, punarapi maranam, getting born and dying again, without the darshan of Lord Ramachandra. So it's a severe punishment. But at the end, Ahalya was uh, Ahalya was given this uh, benediction. But the impersonalists, they don't get that. They don't get that because they're so offensive. Now, apart from the impersonalists in India, There are also uh, so many religions throughout the world. Basically, in uh, sociological terms, we can say there are two main genres or types, classifications of religion in the world. One is... Eastern, which in, again, we can say sociological terms, that includes Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Parsiism, Jainism, Buddhism, did I say? 
then Shintoism, and all that. And then there's the Abrahamic religions, which are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And there are others also. That there's, there's animism all over the world, which means worship of uh, animals, stones, trees, worship of nature. And there's also uh, Satanism, worship of the devil, as he's known in the West, or uh, similar to that is, well, all over the world. There's black, what was called black magic, or in India, tantrism. But the two main religious types in the world are this, we can say, Eastern and Western. Although even the Eastern also, even the Western came out of what's now called the Middle East. Anyway, uh, in these religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they all believe in God. Whereas in Eastern religions, they don't all believe in God. Not, definitely not in the way that they do in the Western religions. Although there are some similarities. There can be some similarities. Just like Vaishnavism. The personality of Godhead as understood in Vaishnavism. There are many parallels with the uh, conception of God in Abrahamic religions. Which isn't one conception, but basically they all believe. As that word is there. Papa didn't like that word, believe very much. Uh, that God is the single supreme entity who creates everything and is in control, the supreme control. Simply put, the supreme control. Whereas in uh, Mayavad Hinduism, the ultimate entity is supposed to be impersonal or actually there is no ultimate entity because there is only one entity. <laughs> That's impersonalism. In Buddhism, there's no supreme entity. There is no entity. It's, that's the difference between, very simply put, between Mayavad and Buddhism. Of course, this is very general very much generalizing that, that in uh, Mayavad all is one and in Buddhism all is zero. But uh, anyway, this idea of God, just like the idea of the Christian God, so that's there. There's the idea of this. There was some idea of the Supreme Person which gradually got in the uh, chronological development of Christianity got uh, reduced to some kind of idea or ideal in many people's minds, as many modern, especially Protestant theologians think that God, for instance, is, well, there's that saying, God is love. When we love each other, that is God, which doesn't say much for the personality of Godhead. Of course, it doesn't say much for our feelings toward cows, for instance. The people who say God is love, they don't love the cows very much. We slaughter them. So they, don't, they also have a very constricted idea of love. But anyway, in Christianity, they've had this idea for 2,000 years about God and they they made a cardinal mistake at the beginning by equating Jesus as being directly God. When I say cardinal, I don't mean the heads of the church, but a major mistake. <clears throat> and in Islam, there's this, uh, it's so extremely impersonal that there's, there's vigorously, although they say God is the Allah is supreme, but 
vigorously deny that he can that he is a person. Although if you ask Muslims, well then how did he speak? He's supposed to have spoken to Muhammad, then how did he speak? And they say, well, it's just a voice. It's still a voice. There must be some specific place where it came from. And a voice means there's some in, there's some intelligence behind it. So it's intelligence from a non-person. So, as you may know, most Muslims, they don't like to discuss very much. It's just, you know... Uh, the, it's a long-standing tradition. You just accept what we say or uh, we'll kill you. That's all. You know, this is argumentum ad vacuum. That's all. So, uh, the, in the name of the all-merciful Allah, we'll chop off your head. Or nowadays, thanks to modern technology, we'll blow you to pieces or whatever. Of course, I'm not saying that every Muslim is like that, but it's it's not a discussable subject in Islam, the nature of God. They just say, well, it's, it's beyond our, us to understand. Whereas we find in the Vedic literature, extends, that is accepted, that God is beyond our ability to understand. But at the same time, there is extensive discussion as to the nature of God not only in terms of his omnipotence, which is mentioned here in his om, what are these three terms? Omnipotence, omnipresence, and omniscience. These are, so, but not only in, in very general terms as to his greatness, but what he looks like. How he interacts with his devotees. There are all kinds of leelas. Apart from those which are given in Shastra, we know some from Bhagavatam. There are many more in the Puranas and many of the, many of the stories of Bhagavatam. There are actually summaries which are ex- ex- given in more detail, just like Nrishimha Leela is given in more detail in Nrishimha Purana, for instance. And we'll find in Mahabharata, Harivangsha, and so many literatures which describe the pastimes of the Lord. And then we have uh, uh, other literatures, which are the, the revelations of, especially Rupa Goswami, Jiva Goswami, about Krishna Leela. And then there are many, many pastimes of the Lord in very pl- various places, especially here in South India. Every, all the temple has a Stala Purana, which describes how the deity came there. In Tirupati, it's very famous. The Lord came there and he has to pay off his debt. So we have to give him some money. And all that. So there are these Tala Puranas of how the Lord came there. And there are many stories of how the Lord reciprocated with his devotees in many ways. The Lord is not a dead stone. He, he reciprocates with his devotees. Uh, <clears throat> so it, it's very uh, prominent in what goes on in Hindu culture that God, even though most people have an impersonal misconception of him, he is a person and he is active. Robert says here, he's not a dead stone, nor is he inactive. He is active in our lives. Now, of course, many people who claim to be Christians, they also say that, yes, Jesus is active in my life, and I, I, you know, he helps me to pass my exams, and then, then uh, get more money. There are peop- many people in America, they claim to talk to Jesus. That uh, when I have some problem or whatever, I ask Jesus, What's going on is they're having some conversation with their own minds. Uh, But they feel they have direct access to Jesus, even in Krishna consciousness. Uh, There are people who, just like uh, there was one bhaktin, which means it's a term used in the West, I believe Prabhupada gave that term, Srila Prabhupada gave that term, for an uninitiated female devotee. 
So she was writing to me and she was asking me what she thought she should do. And I suggested that she dedicate her life to the distribution of Prabhupada's books. She didn't like that suggestion at all. So as she wrote to me in, in an angry letter that she wrote back to me, that uh, she went before Prabhupada and asked him what to do, having been given this terrible advice by this, you know, this Swami. And she relayed what Prabhupada said to her. Prabhupada said to her to kick him in the face, namely myself. So, uh, are we to believe that Srila Prabhupada actually spoke to this uh, Bhaktin? Uh, Prabhupada agreed with her that the advice to distribute his books was not only wrong, but egregiously, to use that fashionable word at the present time, egregiously wrong. Like asking someone to, you know, something like strangle your child or something like that. Asked to distribute the books. And that Srila Prabhupada would uh, ask or order some newcomer to Krishna consciousness to kick a sannyasi disciple of his in the face. So, it's not very believable, for me at least, based on uh, everything we've seen of Srila Prabhupada's teachings. So some people, they think they have a relationship with God, but a, a direct relationship. But it's all based on... what What's actually going on is that they're just fooling themselves into thinking that they are in direct contact with God, but they have no idea of who he actually is. And they don't really want to know either. I mean, if you accept that there is God, as they do in the Abrahamic religions, they accept that there is God, who is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, then... Shouldn't you be eager to know who he is, to dedicate yourself fully to him? It's just an overwhelming, overwhelming consideration of this person who is so great. I, I'm completely dependent upon him for my very existence. And as Prabhupada writes in this purport, not even a blade of grass moves without his. Uh, permission, one, one should be overwhelmed with trying to understand him, uh, but they're not. So w- what kind of religions are these that just, they say there's God, but then the idea is that God just tries to make you just believe in him and do some lip service, and then God will improve your material situation, as if that's all there is to it. To me, it indicates some lack of sincerity. Would you not want to go further? No more. And especially now that the the knowledge of God is there in the form of Srila Prabhupada's books. I mean, there are many books being written by Srila Prabhupada's followers about Krishna consciousness, and that's good that Srila Prabhupada wanted that. But the basic books of knowledge of God have been given by Srila Prabhupada. Those books are particularly Srimad Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavad. Particularly Bhagavad gives uh, knowledge of God, or the personality of Godhead. So now those books are there. I, I, I mean, if people are actually serious to know God, whatever you may be, a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew or whatever, but if you get this, shouldn't you be, and can't you recognize that this, this is actual knowledge of God which we don't have in our tradition? 
there's detailed knowledge of the, beyond the generalization of omniscience, omnipresence, and omni something else, which I forgot. Omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence. Uh, these are very general terms, but the actual detailed knowledge coming from an ancient tradition describing his energies, how he creates, maintains, destroys the world in a cyclical fashion. It's, an, it's another uh, childish uh, conception within the Abrahamic religions that there's the world is created and then it's destroyed and that's it finished. But it's just a blip in time. And for what reason? I believe in Christianity that the, the material world was created because Lucifer was one of the angels who had a falling out with God. Something like that. So it's all... But then God goes on creating more and more souls. I mean, it's, it's a... There's so many problems with Christian theology because most of, almost all of it's made up. It's a major problem. It's just they don't there's, they don't have books of knowledge like Srimad Bhagavatam. There is no information in the Bible about uh, the nature of God, why we're in this material world. Of course, they do have this explanation, but it's highly unsatisfying that. Uh, someone a long time ago ate some fruit and that is the cause of all the suffering since time immemorial. So uh, with, with, with such an incomplete theology which has been built up with, by Aristotle and Aquinas and then for the Protestants by Luther and others uh, they don't really know anything. That's the major problem. They don't know. They don't even know what the soul is. I, I just read that recently. Some of our devotees they met with the, some uh, Christian, both Protestant, Catholic, and Protestant theologians, over the question of the soul. And the devotees can give a very clear understanding of what the soul is based on shastra. But they don't know in Christianity. They don't know, they can't say what the soul is because they don't have any information. The Bible doesn't give any information about this, so all they can do is speculate. So, as Srila Prabhupada said, he gave the example that if you, uh, ju he said, just like people from India, they go to America for higher technical education. So, in the same spirit, if people in the Western countries, they get higher knowledge of the nature of God, then why shouldn't they take it? It's not just like the technological knowledge. It's, we don't, it's not American knowledge. It's knowledge. It's open to everyone. So, if there's knowledge of God, which is clearly superior to anything in the Western tradition, then if people are actually serious to understand God, then they should take it. Of course, what happens is people get locked in their conceptions and they, they, they don't, they're not open-minded enough to, to want to come out. It's not just a, they, a matter of belief or understanding the nature of God, when, we, when someone says they're a Christian or a Muslim, whatever. But there's a whole social package that goes along with it. You're a Christian, and then you go, go to the local church, and you're respected as a, as a faithful member of the congregation, a respectable member of society, and it's a proper thing for an American to be a Christian. In many parts of America still, it's just presumed you sh you're just expected to be a Christian. Not everywhere, not in Los Angeles, but um, in many parts of America. It's just, if you're not a Christian, 
there's something very, you're not considered quite proper, something very strange about you. So people get locked into this, into certain conceptions. But again, if one is actually sincere to know God, and he's confronted with the knowledge of, of Bhagavatam, then he should appreciate that. And, and want to know more and learn more. And, and there's, a, in Krishna consciousness, there's a whole process of purification which enables one to come closer to God. Which simply, there's no such idea in, uh, in the Abrahamic religion. Just like, uh, well, they have rules, like just like thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, which means don't have a Um Thou shalt not steal. Uh, there, there are some rules there, some good moral rules. But the idea that one has to become free from kam, krod, all these things, vita, raga, bhaya, krodha, mannaya, mamupashrita, Bahabo jnana tapasa puta mad bhava magata aha. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that many persons in the past becoming freed from material attachments, from fear and from anger, taking shelter of me, being absorbed in me, becoming purified by knowledge and austerity, Many such persons in the past have come to me, says Krishna. But the, the, even the idea that you have to become free from material attachments, they have no idea that there are even such things as material attachments. And Krishna says, do you have to become free of material attachments to come to me? But they don't even have an idea that there is, they have no conception of what a material attachment is. In the Western countries, this uh, I had this recently some exchange with uh, Radhananda from India, who's living in America. And over the, the, the meaning of the term materialist, or materialistic, because in the Western countries, people think that one is materialistic if he's interested in having opulent house, car, jewelry, and all this thing. But in the Krishna conscious conception, Materialistic means, even if you're not interested in that, to be interested in home, wife, comfort, even if you're not interested in getting a billion dollars. But any kind of material attachment is called materialistic. So they think that... They they don't have this idea that material attachment... You can be materially attached to your little cottage. And that's materialistic. And you can be materially attached to being considered not materialistic. Prabhupada writes in one purport in the seventh canto that a sannyasi, he can be attached to his little ashram and his water pot. It's also an attachment. We find in the history of Ramanuja that that the uh, Ramanuja arranged once for all his sannyasis to have their copins all mixed up, and they all became so upset. And Ramanuja said, "You see, you're just all attached to your copin," <laughs> because they thought that this uh, Dhanardas, I believe in Sanskrit term, he and his wife were very materialistic, and why is our guru giving them so much attention. They have jewels and all this. Anyway, that's a long story. Which I guess Vaishnavs in Tamil Nadu, they all used to know, but nowadays people don't know all these things. So, I mean, there's just so much more depth. It's in Vaishnav culture, in yeah, the, the depth of understanding, of culture, of the whole process, just like this 
this uh, chapter is called the first step in God realization. But in, in much of Christianity, they just reduce it to, well, you just believe in Jesus. That's all. It's, it's not even defined what it means to say, I, I believe that Jesus is my own personal savior. And you just have to believe that Jesus arose from the dead to redeem the sinners. Which again is a bizarre idea. That if you say Jesus is God and then he was dead. It's just completely bizarre. So people should rec- they should recognize. But what's going on? Kali Yoga means people are becoming more and more stupid day by day. And they're so arrogant that they take their stupidity to be a sign of their superiority. So, it's a very difficult situation. Therefore, Harinam, do book distribution, Harinam, let people hear the holy names. Give them prasada. Give them the books. I mean, these fanatical Christians, this Christianity is being spread so much in South India especially. What they're doing basically, they're going to people who are mostly very uneducated and you know, just brainwashing them with all these bogus ideas and turning people into fanatics. So they won't even look at these people. They won't even consider. And they think that Krishna consciousness is like something evil from the devil. But is, is, how can they think when, when you're chanting happily in, the, in Krishna consciousness, chanting the holy names, in Madangas and Christ, it's very joyful. I mean, how can people think that this is something evil? According to these fanatical Christians, not all Christians, I know. I'm, I'm not saying that all of Christianity is bad or all Christians are bad, but especially this conversion that's going on in India and the kind of attitudes that they promote, this evangelical, fundamental, fanatical Christianity. It's, uh, they have the idea that, well, you're just, you're doomed to hell if you don't believe what they believe. Although there's no, there's no inte- there's no intelligent grounds on which they should believe. Maybe they consider that uh, like the qualification, because if, if if there's no intelligence required to understand it, then the fact that their philosophy or lack of it is completely stupid, maybe they take that as part of their religion that you know you just have to believe it. See that it's unintelligent; it doesn't make any sense. That maybe they take that as a, as a good qualification, just like they say the world was created six thousand years ago by God. And what about the dinosaur bones that these archaeologists are finding? And they say God planted that to test our faith. <laughs> so that's what I say: stupidity will be taken to be a sign of virtue. So, but, yeah, if you see devotees dancing and chanting and singing, how can you say this is... It must be... It should be difficult for people to think that this is actually something from the devil. It's another thing they made up. They invented this devil, some competitor to God. So, those who are actually sincere and who want to understand God, and they should take to Krishna consciousness. Unfortunately, sincerity is not very common. And even in spreading Krishna consciousness, it seems in many cases that it's easier to do it by insincerity. Sorry to say. Just like if we tell people, well, you keep the deities and you don't have to bother worshipping them. You just keep them. Just do whatever you like, whenever you like. And then insincere people think, oh, that's good. I get all the benefit without any of the hard work. 
So insincere people will like that. Or you do some yajna, you get this sarpa dosh removed and all this and that. But uh, we don't tell people that you got the, the real dosh is not sarpa dosh, it's janma mrityu, jaravyadhi, dukkha dosh, anudarsana. Birth, death, old age and disease. And the sarpa dosh, whatever that is, I know that is some astrological term, that's just a symptom of the bigger problem. That's what we should tell people instead of taking 10,000 rupees from them for some sarpa dosh, remove that so they can get on with their business of eating, sleeping, mating and defending in full force. So, it's, in Kali Yuga, it's easier to cheat people than to give them the real thing. But that doesn't mean that we should do that, nor should we think that expertise in cheating people is called good preaching. Increase the numbers, increase the opulence, but wait a minute, what's going on here? I mean, are actually people understanding what is the philosophy of Krishna consciousness? Are they actually surrendering to Krishna? Are they, be, are they striving to become free from Kam Krod Lo Mohammada Matsarya? I mean, we shouldn't be so enamored by increasing numbers, just trying to increase the numbers that we uh, water down the whole process. Because the personality of Godhead is not a dead stone. He wants our love, but love means we have to give ourselves to him. We can't... One thing about Krishna consciousness is that you can't, because Krishna is a person and he calls the shots, which means he makes the rules, that in one sense you can't water it down. We can appear to water it down, but then it's just not Krishna consciousness because Krishna doesn't accept it, that's all. We can say that, well, you know, we'll just do what we like, how we like, whenever we like, and hurry bow. But Krishna will say, I don't have to accept this. You know, Krishna is not obliged to accept our artificial show of Krishna consciousness. He's given the process and we have to follow it. And then he'll reciprocate. If we actually want to love him, then we love him. Then we, we do what he says. That was Prabhupada's Argument against the Christians. Why, if they're actually Christians, why don't they do what Jesus said? Why are they killing? So in the same way, if we want to be known as followers of Prabhupada, why don't we do what Prabhupada says? Otherwise, we're just, uh, it's just a show of religion. It's not the real thing. So here we see how Prabhupada feels for Krishna. He doesn't want this uh, to just God is just a dead stone or on the other side, the Mayavadi side, on the other side is the Sahajya side where you just convert Krishna into, just like they have these Krishna cartoons or whatever. You just convert Krishna into some kind of make-believe cartoon figure uh, or, or you... Or you just have stories about Krishna, but no, uh, no sincere endeavor to understand who he is as he presents himself to us through Shastra. So this is all cheating religion, which is rejected in the beginning of Bhagavata. Hare Krishna. Any comment or question about this, please? Shastras and Acharyas always insist that deities should be worshipped after the installation. Yeah, insist means that it's just expected. It's just like, you know, you have a baby, what for? To eat it? You, 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 you have a baby with the idea that you're going to look after the baby. You don't have to... You don't have to uh, like give the parents a big, 
lecture and train them. Now you have to look after the baby. You should. Re- it's just understood that having brought a child into this world, they did so because they want to look after the child. Of course, nowadays it's such a horrible situation that in many cases they don't want to. Or they have bought the child in advance. Or the child is born and then they abandon them or whatever. But generally it's understood that well, that's considered you know, abominable. If, if the parents abandon the child or kill the child, which does happen. But it, it's just naturally presumed that parents have children because they want to care for them and look after them and love them. And so in the same way, when you say the Acharyas insist that we worship the deities, uh, I don't know if they do so much because it's just... They give directions on what should be done, but it's just presumed that people install deities because they want to worship them. Just like it's presumed that parents have children because they want to look after them. If they don't, there's some... They actually become criminally liable. Oh, that's another thing, the uninstalled deities. Where does that idea come from? There is one letter in the very early days of Iskon in which Prabhupada said that the deities are not installed. So that it's like 1967. So the devotees were asking about going to a festival and Prabhupada said the deities are not installed so you can keep them and when you come back you can worship them again. But that, that was before Prabhupada had established proper deity worship. That definitely wasn't the standard that he made. But this idea... I often hear this. So I say, look, I tell someone, look, you haven't, you're not doing this properly in this Oh, no, it doesn't matter. They're not installed. Just rascal them. This idea that we have uninstalled deities, therefore we just do whatever we like, however we like, whenever we like. There's no, this is, this is impersonalism. Is the deity Krishna or not? If he's not Krishna, then why are you worshipping him? Then you're just an impersonalist making a show. And if he is Krishna, then you better worship him properly. Either way, I, if you say uninstalled and we don't worship properly, then I, either way you're offensive. Either, either you think uninstalled so he's not Krishna, or you think he is Krishna but we don't care. We can't be bothered to worship him properly or we don't have enough manpower, then don't worship, don't start. That's why Prabhupada, he was so insistent. You have to have 12 Brahmins before you start deity worship. You have 12 Brahmins in a temple. Otherwise, don't. Don't start. Don't start deity worship. Don't make it a farce, as Srila Prabhupada used that word. There's some very, very heavy statements. There's one, like the whole, when he said, Prabhupada said, that when we don't worship the deities properly, then all, all our movement will be spoiled. Again, I'm paraphrasing, but very, very strong statements, which we should take seriously. We're, we're not taking Krishna seriously enough. There's this idea, oh, they're only Gornitai. As if, you know, Gornitai, they, we, we can bring them just so we can insult them day and night. It's not devotional. And uh, the thing is that most of our devotees nowadays, they don't even know. They're trained from the, they're trained from the beginning to think that this offensiveness is normal. That this is bhakti. They're trained to make it. They're, they're training in Christian consciousness how to be offensive. To. Well, then we go to some days that is like the how is You see, there are so many problems. The thing is, we may say that Prabhupada said this and that, but in many cases, they don't care what Prabhupada said. I was there saying, well, my guru said, as if your guru is a higher authority than Prabhupada. The guru is a guru if he represents and follows Prabhupada. That is the qualification to be a guru. Not that your guru has, he has some kind of right just to throw out everything Prabhupada said and make some idea of his own. It's not a guru. At least, 
not the, not the guru who's going to link you with Prabhupada. The guru who's going to link you with Prabhupada is one who knows what Prabhupada says and teaches his disciples the same thing. Not making some weak excuse like time, place and circumstance just changes everything. Well, in many cases, the gurus may not know that you know, they're so busy, I don't know what they're doing, but it may be some someone else's, you know, some temple president, I don't know whatever's going on. But, but those are gurus, those are installing deities, those who are GBCs. It's their duty to see that the temple standards, uh, this is not my idea, if you want to follow what Prabhupada says, read his letters, he says it again and again and again. Prabhupada says it's the duty of the GBC members to see that, that everyone in the temple is rising early, that the temple is clean. All the, everyone is chanting 16 rounds, all these basic things. The deity worship is properly maintained. And the funny thing is, if you just nowadays if we just say these things that Prabhupada said, you're accused of being offensive. Because people are not following what Prabhupada say, and if you point it out, then you become offensive. Wait a minute, who's offensive? <laughs> you know, it like, you know, creates some disturbance in society. In the, you know, we'd all just like to be nice and smile at each other, and, and, and in the meantime, the, the deities are neglected. And if you say anything, then you're an offender. If you don't say anything, you're not an offender. You just go, you neglect the deities, you're not an offender. If you say anything about it, then you're an offender. This is very strange. Are you actually worship? Is it actually worship of Krishna? Is, is Krishna obliged to be there because you're doing your what you call your worship, which is grossly substandard? Krishna is not obliged to accept. Is what you eat prasadam here? Yeah? You have to see who's cooking also. Who's cooking? Are they chanting sixteen rounds, following the four regulated principles? The consciousness of the cook makes so much difference. In one place, Srila, Srila Prabhupada came. I was told this. I, 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 actually, I don't have a reference for this. But there, was, there was so much disturbance in the temple. The devotees were arguing and Prabhupada said, change the cook. I've had that experience myself on the few, I, I have on a few occasions while traveling in India, this is a long time ago before we had devotees in different places. Sometimes, just like in uh, Chitrakoot, I went there many years ago to do, a, to do an article for this Back to Godhead magazine. Myself, I went with Mahavishnu, the photographer. So we arrived in the evening, and it was very cold at night, we didn't eat anything, and then in the morning, we went out early in the morning and started going around and shooting, and by mid it was very cold, it was the winter, by midday we were very hungry, and we hadn't really thought about what we were going to eat, we thought, yeah, we'll get something to eat, when we'll do our service, and then at midday when the temples are closed, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll think about something to eat, but there was... It was, a, it was a very small bazaar. There's probably there's no fruit, so we we could have just bought some dried peanuts or, uh, or something like that. There was the only the only thing to eat was food cooked by Kami. So we went in the best restaurant in town, which I think was the only restaurant. It was some not very nice place, and we took what was there. Some chapatis and sabji and this and that. Fortunately, didn't have onions. But we could, you could, even though we were very hungry, and as far as I remember, it tasted quite good, because well, when you're hungry, everything tastes good. But, uh, you know, we could, we didn't, in one sense, we, you know, we were very hungry, there's hot food, 
In one sense we were happy to take, but in another sense we could both feel this is very different from prasadam. It's not cooked by devotees. It's in a holy place. No doubt the people cooking it all have affection for Lord Rama. But it's restaurant food and it's it's not the same. You can feel the difference. It's becoming more common knowledge in the heart and the planetary kitchen in this world. Many of them are getting up on the shoulders of just for offering and not to eat. Yeah. Anyway, if we start talking about all these things, then we'll be here all day. I just gave some general idea. And if we do try to follow strictly, then we'll find that the whole atmosphere is lifted up, which I think we can we can say that from those centers where they do follow strictly. You'll find in Los Angeles they, they keep the standard of deity worship exactly as what Prabhupada himself personally gave. They never compromised even a bit. There are some places like that. Bhaktivedanta Mana, Central London, Soho Street, they keep the same standard. In many places they don't. For one reason or another, they, it may be the lack of manpower, this, that, that. When you go in a temple where the deity is so nicely worshipped, then it's naturally you feel very happy. If you see some place where the deities are being neglected, and there are three altars, but only one pujari to do the aratis, and it's not so pleasing. There's definite difference. 